Joined now by Shea Dixon of On Threes, the Bengal Tiger, covering LSU. And it's about time we get into our deep dive for the LSU 2024 schedule. Nine and a half is your win total at FanDuel. Another one of these, like, Shea, I swear, with like with Ole Miss, with, oh, just there's ones all over the map. Where Alabama is a nine Bama's and a half. Nine, yeah, like Alabama's a nine and a half, right? Yeah, it feels like they are saying, and maybe this is by design to uh, to make it a little easier for you to make your decision on those over unders. Like they're basically saying, do you think this team's going to make the twelve team college football playoff? I've kind of stood by. Is the best avenue a chance? Like an LSU? Okay, well, the best avenue would be going to Atlanta and winning, right? But is an app going 10 and two and not having to go to Atlanta, but having two impressive losses or, you know, two losses to the number one and six teams in the country, whatever it might be. Is that a ticket into a 12 team playoff? I, I think that's the big debate right now. And for sec fans. Oh, I, I think you're right. Because I think the assumption is any 10 win sec team is in. And I also think people don't understand how hard with the new SEC schedules it's going to be when you add Texas and Oklahoma to the mix to get to 10 wins. It, it's interesting. And now look, LSU got a taste of Texas already. They've played OU before uh, a handful of times. But yes, get navigating 10 wins. I think you look at Florida schedule, right? I mean, right. has there been a harder schedule in college football in the past 10, 20 years? It, certainly it's up there. You look at LSU's and in comparison to Florida, much more, uh, much more when you can navigate. But I mean, you're playing USC and UCLA uh, and I get UCLA isn't the UCLA of old, but still. And then you've got your normal SEC slate. You add Oklahoma, uh, you keep Florida, which has kind of been your division rival every year. Uh, and I know that uh, folks aren't the highest on Billy Napier and them at the moment, but playing at Florida is never an easy task. Andy, you know that. That you look at that right there and are like, okay, I'm, I agree with Vegas. I am, I know that. Look, this is an LSU team, and we can dive deeper in, in a moment. But that went to Oxford last year, put up nearly seven seven hundred yards, put up forty nine points, and lost, and finished the season what nine and three. So it's the margin for error is so small, especially when you throw in kind of outlandish stats like that, where you would think that that would net no team would ever score 50 points and put up 700 yards an LSU team and lose, right? Like impossible. It happened this past year. Well, and that's, that's what I'm curious about because, you know, we watched Brian Thomas at the combine over the weekend, incredible performance by him. And he wasn't even LSU's best receiver last year. That was Malik neighbors. So Brian Thomas, Malik neighbors, Jaden Daniels gone from that offense. The defense obviously was terrible last year. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. There's no way to sugarcoat it. So my question is, can the defense improve enough to make up for what might not be a historically good offense after they lose the, the key pieces to a historically good offense? Yeah, it's like what we had to preach post-2019, um, though I think they were set up a bit better right now than they were post-2019, but it was you're not going to have the number one offense again. It just doesn't work that way. You had a number one or two pick here at quarterback, uh, you know, top three pick uh, in Jaden Daniels, a Heisman winner. Uh, and then, as you noted, these receivers on that receiver front real quick. And I think it speaks to kind of, are they able to replicate enough to not fall backwards, you know, out of the top 10, let's say, or top 15 in total offense. Only two guys hit the portal that were a thousand yard receivers and double digit touchdowns from a year ago. Liberty CJ Daniels, who was on one of the best offenses in the country, Liberty ranked not far behind LSU uh, in Jamie Chadwell's offense. He transfers to LSU and then Jamari Macklin from North Texas went to Kentucky. So LSU loses only 11 guys last year, hit double digit touchdowns and a thousand yards receiving two of them, as you noted, were LSU guys, neighbors and Thomas. So am I saying CJ Daniels coming from Liberty We'll replicate those stats, you know, from the jump from playing at a Liberty to playing in the SEC week in and week out. Or does he have that first round pick label that these two guys carry? I'm not saying that right now. I'm just saying that was a massive add out of the portal, mm -hmm. to at least soften the blow. Defensively, though, and we can talk about this for days, you know that, Andy, 
Brian Kelly shows up to the office one day and fires every single one of the defensive staff members. I mean, we thought there would maybe be a change at DC, right? We thought, okay, they'll probably change things at this position, that position. Not all five being announced is let go at one time. And when you look at what he was able to do in a very short span, I mean, the, not like this dragged out months. In a few weeks, you get Bo Davis, an LSU grad, back from Texas. And he's one of those guys that was rumored every couple of years, oh, he's going to come home. He's coming back to LSU. And it never came to fruition. Now he's back as the D-line coach and hopefully puts a stop to sort of this turnover they've had there. Corey Raymond, one of the names most synonymous with LSU defensive backs, is back. Then you've got Blake Baker, one of the young and up and coming DCs. He went to Tulane. He was at La Tech forever. Like he knows Louisiana. He brings. He was at LSU. Peoples. <laughs> so I don't think that you could have, I mean, drawn up a better plan for saying, okay, we're wiping the slate clean. All right. Well, what are your answers for it, Brian Kelly? And these aren't a bunch of old Notre Dame coaches or anything like that. Like they hired what fits LSU best. And I think that, uh, is something that's going to kind of be the storyline uh, of the offseason is how far can those coaches take this defense? Because, Andy, let's be real, how much of it was coaching last year and how much, it's, much of it is personnel? Well, when you rank right. in the 130s at the end of the year, 115 or whatever it was, it's both it's probably everything, right? It's probably yeah. a mix of it all. So overnight, they didn't fix the players on the team or who you've got. So, yes, they added pieces. They should be better there. But I think it's really how much does the coaching change and kind of bridge that gap from the hundreds to whatever the answer to your question might be, the 60s, 50s? And I think the 60s or 50s might work. You I think that might be good enough because, yeah, like the, the, the offense, you know, we talk about what they lose, but they had a quarterback waiting in the wings in Garrett Nussmeyer that they like, that they're comfortable with. They have these two offensive tackles and Will Campbell and Emory Jones who've been starting since they were freshmen who are going to be high NFL picks next year. They, they feel good about their offensive line. Like the offense probably isn't going to take a huge step back. So decent defense probably gets it done. I mean, it's the narrative of if they would have had what? I mean, they had the number one offense. They had would have had the number 40 defense instead of 113 overall. Oh, they're, 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 they might win the SEC. I mean, you're playing in the playoffs. You're maybe competing for a national championship. I mean, no one was stopping LSU's offense. The defense was just so poor that it resulted in firing, letting go of the entire side of that staff just two years into the Kelly regime. And then Kelly bringing back guys like Corey Raymond, Blake Baker, they were on staff before Kelly got here. Then went elsewhere, obviously Baker coming back as a DC. But again, I think this just reinforces that Kelly's bought into LSU, what's best for LSU, and how much can you bridge that gap? I'm with you. I don't think the offense falls out all that much. If it can stay in the top 20, awesome. That puts you right in the mix. Defense, if you can just cut that in half and get into the 60s, that's you're in way better shape. I think many people would take a top 15 to 20 offense and a top 50 defense then the number one offense and the number 115 defense. So finding that blend, I think, is what's really key to this year and, and getting to 10 wins. Yeah. FanDuel.com slash staples. New customers get $200 in bonus bets when you place a $5 bet. Sign up is easy. There's all kinds of ways to play. Obviously, right now you can, you can play with – you can bet on college basketball, NBA, NHL. MLB is getting started. So lots of ways to do it. But in, in college football, you've got Heisman futures. You've got win totals, which we're going to keep going over those because I, I'm telling you, every chance we get to go to these new schedules is more interesting than the next. And so uh, FanDuel has been uh, doing the Lord's work with these win totals because they really are interesting. Like the, the numbers they've set, like this LSU one, and you're going to hear when we talk to Shea Dixon about it. It is a tough number, and it feels like they're right on it. There's a couple, you know, razor's edge type games where it could go either way. So I am fascinated by all of these, and and of course they'll evolve as we get closer to the season, as spring practices take place, as we find out how rosters are going to look, as the spring transfer portal happens. All of this is going to evolve. So FanDuel.com/staples, get yourself signed up. Five dollar bet. Gets you $200 in bonus bets. 
That first game in Vegas is so fascinating to me because the same day Lincoln Riley goes to USC, Brian Kelly goes to LSU, two coaching moves we never would have imagined before they happened. They're going to coach against each other. They're both coming off a season where they had the same problem, where the defense just couldn't. Now, Lincoln Riley's had that problem multiple times. Brian Kelly, it's, it's a new thing. But the defense has to be better. Both of them have brand new defensive staffs. Both of them maybe starting a quarterback who kind of waited their turn behind a Heisman winner. Like it is, the parallels are incredible. You give the edge here to who? Because Vegas has this as an LSU, what? Tut, it, gosh, I need to look it up before I said it, but it was more than three points. I mean, LSU, they're considered the favorite here. All right, LSU has better players. Like th their talent level is higher based on, based on what we've seen from the guys who've played. Now, there are like one-off situations, like Zachariah Branch will be one of the best five athletes on the field for sure. Sure. But I would say LSU probably has more good athletes than USC does at this point based on just how these teams are recruited. Early preview, kick it out of the end zone. That's going to be the key <laughs> Yes, here, right? through the uh, end zone, please. anything on special teams to Zachariah Branch. Uh, no, I'm with you. I also think... I'd give the edge, as you mentioned, it's been kind of a recurring theme there with Lincoln Riley. I feel like Brian Kelly's at a stage of his career. And you, when you've coached for 30 something years and with saving out now, he's one of the most accomplished, tenured, however you want to put it, upper echelon coaches out there, doesn't have a national championship at the FBS level. And that points to why he came to LSU. He knows, hey, I'm in my 60s. This is it for me. I want to go down there and compete for championships. And if three different head coaches in less than 20 years could win there, can I win there? And he's won everywhere else he's been, takes over that roster that was depleted. And I don't know if everyone thinks about it because LSU hasn't been in a New Year's Six the past two years. They've known that, oh, well, look, LSU made it the SEC championship. Oh, LSU had a Heisman winner in this great offense, but a bad defense. They won 10 games in back-to-back -back seasons. So if they can find a way to just get a bit better than they were these past two seasons, find that 10 win mark again. Uh, I, I think that Brian Kelly goes into this season as one of the most experienced coaches out there. And when you match him up in that week one matchup, which has not voted well for LSU, they've lost back to back games to Florida state uh, in week one, they need a week one win. I think Brian Kelly is, uh, is locked in uh, this spring and summer on, how do we take the steps necessary, which he's seen over all these years, Andy coaching to bridge the gap from where we were to where we need to be right out of the gates. And look, LSU shot themselves in the foot uh, two years ago uh, and could have won that Florida State game last year. They just got routed in week one and, and ultimately it turned around for them. And Florida State turns out to be a pretty good team. So uh, I don't think USC is as good as FSU. I think LSU's got a little bit better matchup here, even if it is all the way out in Vegas. Well, and and it's funny because at first glance you're looking at it, why is LSU trying to win the Pac-12? Oh wait, they're no, they're trying to win the Big Ten this year because they've got UCLA coming in a little bit later. Actually, after they've already started conference play at South Carolina, and then the following week they get they get the Bruins. But that you know UCLA, you don't feel that worried about them because they've gone through a coaching change. Lord knows what they're going to be at the end of the uh, the spring portal window. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, good luck to Deshaun Foster as he tries to, to resurrect that program. But let's talk about the SEC schedule. It feels like that, that Ole Miss visit to Baton Rouge may be the swing. That may be the one that decides, do you make the playoff? Do you not? I think for, for LSU last year, that Ole Miss game in Oxford was the, the critical game because if they win that game, their season looks very different. I'm with you. And look, getting up to it, you just look at it. I mean, to open with USC, you have to get past that hurdle. Yes, you're going to probably, you're going to win these non-con games against Nichols and, and USA, but at South Carolina, that's a tricky spot for them. Not a place LSU goes very much. No one on this team's ever played there. Uh, Tough road environment when, they, when they're doing well. Yeah. So that's a hurdle. Uh, UCLA, no, not the UCLA of old, but you got to win the game and they have talent on the team. And I'm with you, Ole Miss. I mean, that's just going to be a shootout. It was a year ago. How do you slow down what we presume will probably be? And I don't have Ole Miss's schedule in front of me, but I don't know how many hurdles Ole Miss has before that game. And they've, what, past two seasons have started out really strong where they're 6-7-0 and and highly ranked. So, yes, I would circle that part right there at the midpoint of the season. Because if you turn the page and you look at the backside of it, if you're, that, if you're undefeated at that point, 
look, you're thinking, all right, we can do this one week at a time. And you start knocking out an Arkansas, get a win against an A&M. And you're set up against this new age of Alabama. Um, I'm, I think most LSU fans look at the schedule and say, I'd like to be going into that Alabama game with one or zero losses. The A&M game is, is a tricky one. We had Mike Elko on last week and it, it's interesting to me because now he, he says the roster needed some work when he got there, but we all know they, they did recruit pretty well under Jimbo Fisher. I do wonder if like Colin Klein comes in, he gets a healthy Connor Wigman back. Like, could they be much better in a, a scary proposition for all of these, you know, SEC teams that think they're going to make the playoff? Uh, well, I think that they have to be better, right? I mean, getting Wegman back is huge. They were in QB purgatory there uh, for a stretch through a rash of injuries and transfers and all of that. But look, I mean, just look what Elko did at Duke. I mean, how quick that turnaround from three wins or whatever it was to uh, what he did two years ago when they had, what, nearly double-digit wins and Riley Leonard kind of really burst onto the scene. Uh, solid season this year. And what I also point to, look at the coaches he's always had. I mean, a number of those Duke guys have gotten hired that came through there uh, at big-time mm -hmm. programs. He's got some on, on his staff now. Um, but he knows, like, the DeBoer talk of the lay of the land and the SEC, all that, like, that's not a conversation a and having to worry about right now or talk about or recruiting the South or anything like that. So, yes, I think Elko's a really good coach. I think that a and Also knows got, Brian Kelly. Yeah. I think, right. I think A&M is also set up well on the NIL side. Like it's, yeah. and I'm not even talking just paying for play. Like there's not a football or I'm not a program out there. That's got the kind of money LSU does where their, their alumni invest across the board from education to athletics. So they, yes, I 100, 100% think that moving forward, A&M is going to be better than they've been, which is uh, obviously been furious for them, but kind of just meddling around in the kind of middle of the SEC race. So after that game at Kyle Field, LSU gets a week off, and then Alabama comes to Baton Rouge, but it's no longer Nick Saban. How weird is that going to be? I mean, as weird as it was when Nick Saban was first at Alabama coming to LSU where he used to coach, how weird will it be to see an Alabama team walk into Tiger Stadium without Nick Saban? So what was the coach for the Dolphins for two years? Two years, yep. Okay, so and what he got to LSU in 2000. So between now and 2000, take away two years, and that's how many times Saban hasn't been on the sidelines for that LSU-Alabama game every November, uh, let alone when they've played, gosh, they played for a national championship, an SEC yep. championship. So it will um, – it will be odd. I will say that I'm not sure there was a fan base, maybe Auburn, uh, but I, a fan base out there that was uh, more than happy to see uh, see the, one of the greatest ever hang it up and and welcome in a new regime, whatever it was. I mean, they could have hired Bill Belich. It didn't matter. Anyone that wasn't Saban for LSU fans who have now lived through more than a decade of him coming. And uh, if it weren't, you know, you play revisionist history. If he never goes to Alabama, do they go on that run or does LSU go on some sort of run? Because uh, let's be real, right? When L at the kind of the peak of Bama's dynasty, it was always LSU right there behind them uh, as that second place team in the West. So yes, uh, whether Kalen DeBoer is the best of all time or not, I know LSU fans are just happy. It's not saving anymore. And it's interesting now because that, you know, for a while it was Arkansas that, that LSU would end the season with, and then it was Texas A&M. This year they get Oklahoma though. They're in their first exposure to the new guys. And, you know, they, they just played Texas in a series fairly recently. So we have seen that. But how excited are you for, for the Sooners to come into Tiger Stadium? And that that's the thing, like seeing these types, like Georgia is going to Austin. Tennessee is going to Norman. Oklahoma is coming to Baton Rouge. Like that just pumps me up even thinking about it. Yeah, it was uh, It was actually on the schedule too. I don't know if it was for this past season or this year or maybe it was next year, but it was Oklahoma at LSU and Texas supposed to play LSU as well uh, since LSU had gone to Texas. And then the SEC kind of really all the talk heated up and they were going to come to the conference. And then the games disappear off LSU's website. And they're like, yes, the, the games have been canceled and no longer be played. Uh, and now they're going to be permanent. Here comes Oklahoma. Uh, right away in year one, making the trip to LSU. So 
I'm de that's one I've got circled uh, probably as my the game I'm most excited to see because uh, you only get one of OU or Texas. So I think a lot of LSU fans were kind of rooting for Texas. There's just that natural rivalry there and they wanted them to come back. But that'll happen in the future this year. They'll get a taste of Venables and OU and and LSU's fared uh, fairly well against OU. Um, they've met a lot of big yeah. spot, obviously, playoffs and national championships. But uh, boy, that last game was. Uh, yes, one of the greatest teams of all time in 2019, but boy, they cleaned up on Jalen Hurts and that team. I think the game, game was like 60-something to 24 or something. It, it was uh, over like five minutes into the game. Yeah. So um, <laughs> be those days are gone. Maybe I, I think this year we're going to see a little bit tighter of a game between the two. Well, I, and that's I'm excited about that because it, I look at this schedule, I see a bunch of toss-ups, but I can see a path. I can see a path where LSU is in the playoff. I can see a path where LSU's eight and four and everybody's mad. And it's it's very hard, like with LSU, with Ole Miss, uh, we're going to do Texas A&M's a little bit later. We've done Texas. It's some, because we just like, what will Oklahoma be? We did Oklahoma last week. You know, their, their win total is seven and a half. Like, I yeah, feel like that's go. an I, easy, easy over. I saw someone um, reputable, um, and, and if it was you, I apologize. It is. You can just expound on it. But they had ranked uh, the SEC team, SEC teams going into next year, and Oklahoma was like nine on the list or something. I was like, that, that wasn't can't me. be right. And I'm looking at the win total, and I'm like, oh, God, eight or nine SEC stacked if Oklahoma is your eighth or ninth best team. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing. Even if you think they're going to be pretty good, even if think, think, you think Oklahoma is going to win eight games, well, okay. That probably puts them behind Georgia, Alabama, LSU, Texas, mm -hmm. Ole Miss. More we don't know what Tennessee eight, or Missouri is going to be like. More it's... teams than eight and four used to put you behind, and and let's be real: if you're an upper echelon team, which Oklahoma should consider themselves, certainly, Andy. How many years do SEC teams, good SEC teams, go eight and four and celebrate that? Never. I mean. Nobody's celebrating an eight and four season nope. if you're at the middle of the pack and above in the SEC. Yeah, and that's the thing for Brian Kelly is he's kind of riding that razor's edge right now. He's got the two 10 win seasons. He's got to keep that up. And because listen, we know at LSU they they turn on you quick if you're not winning those double digit games every year. So, uh, but I, I do think the defense can get. But I think the Bo Davis hire is is probably the most significant of those you look at what he did at alabama and at texas uh the texas d-line evolution in the last few years is a big reason why we're looking at texas right now as a potential sec champion this year and now that guy's at lsu so that's a, that's saying something well and people think of lsu especially people our age and above who think back to the early days of the saban era and marcus spears and all those guys playing d-line and on even through the less years it was as much DBU as D line you, it was yeah. Jackson Jackson was a top five pick. I mean, there were a lot of guys that came through here. All the way to Dorsey like Hunter became one of the highest paid D line in the history of the NFL. And they've gone since Orgeron took the job, head coaching job and got promoted from D line coach. So that was eight years ago. They've had a new D line coach every single season that I'm sure that that's a run that nobody's ever been on, but a new <laughs> D line coach every single season. So, for college football fans who also know about recruiting, that doesn't bode well. You then don't carry over relationships. And I think it showed. That's why D-line's been, been a, kind of a bit of a hit for them right now. They don't have a ton of DT depth. And that's a big worry for them. And it's something you'd never thought you'd have to worry about at a school like LSU. So for so many reasons, and especially if it means stability. I mean, he's from Mississippi, went to LSU. He got his coaching career started at LSU. He's up. He's now been... From the NFL to, as you mentioned, stints at Bama and Texas that were extended and very successful. Is this finally him saying, all right, I'm going to settle in here for three, four, five years? That'd be awesome for LSU because I said turnover every single year has been bad. If you have a D-line coach like Bo Davis who knows how to develop and recruit and stays on staff for multiple year years, you'll start to see sort of the fruits of those labors, I think, no doubt. Well, we're going to find out nine and a half, your total for LSU. Will they make the playoff or will they, they not? Pick That's all, the question. All, pick all like the four or five teams that you think are all pretty good and you don't know how good. They could be great with yep. nine and a half. There you go. 
Uh, it, exactly. That's that. There's a lot of nine and a half and a lot of eight and a half floating around the country, and they ain't all going to win that many. But in Baton Rouge, I think they think they're going to win more than that. So, Shay, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Andy. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On3Sports YouTube channel.